And uh, okay, so I thought we'd better uh, backtrack just a little bit and make sure that uh, everybody remembers what we're doing, because we've uh, in the last three lectures we've been working towards a proof of a theorem, um, and it's been a while since we've uh, you know sort of been reminded why and, and what's going on. So let's just back up just a little bit. So remember we've got uh, a mean curvature flow. The, the singularities of the mean curvature flow are, are modeled are, are given by these self shrinkers. Um, the self-shrinkers uh, satisfy this nice equation, say the time minus one slice, you know, h is equal to x dot n over two. Um, and then we've defined this quantity that we um, want to keep track of. This quantity we, we call the entropy, which is a bad choice for a name. Um, uh, but uh, so it's this function lambda. And lambda is just given by, it's defined on a hypersurface. You don't need to have any flow going on. You just take a hypersurface. And then you look at all these Gaussian integrals. So these Gaussian integrals have two parameters that, they vary, that you vary. There's the scale, which is this t0, and there's the center of the Gaussian, that's x0. And now I take the soup of that over all possible scales and centers. That gives me a number lambda. And um, now what are the properties of this lambda? So this lambda, because of the way that we've done the soup, lambda is invariant under dilations, rotations, and translations. Lambda is also non-increasing under the mean curvature flow. That follows from the monotonicity formula. And finally, um, if you have a self-shrinker, then lambda is, is just equal to the, the Gaussian density uh, centered at 0 and on scale 1, so f0, 1 functional. OK, so and then we just reminded a couple of entropies. And now what was the, the why? Uh, so entropy is defined just on a hypersurface. How is it useful with flows? Uh, or how does it tie in with the mean curvature flow, other, of course, than this, this nice connection with self-shrinkers? Uh, the point is that because the entropy is monotone along the flow, it controls um, the entropy at, at, at one time, controls the entropy of any possible singularity at a future time. Okay, so if the entropy is, is below a certain threshold, uh, it, if it's below this F01 of a self-shrinker, that self-shrinker can never appear as a tangent flow to the mean curvature flow. This gives us a way that we can rule out certain classes of self-shrinkers from appearing in the flow. OK, now what was the main theorem? So the main theorem is this classification of entropy-stable self-shrinkers. So we show that if you have a, a self-shrinker always embedded and with Euclidean volume growth and complete, and it's not a plane, sphere, or cylinder, then you can perturb it to find an arbitrarily close, you know, nearby uh, uh, hypersurface, this is no longer a self-shrinker, where the entropy has gone down. So this means, suppose, so, so what's an example of one that is not a, a plane sphere or cylinder? Well, the, the list is rather small at this point, but suppose you're at Anginant Shrinking Donut. So Anginant Shrinking Donut is this self-similar torus which disappears at a point. This result says that I can wiggle that a little bit, and the tangent, and, and again, there, there will be singularities in the future. Now I restart the mean curvature flow, but none of those singularities is going to be a shrinking donut. Okay, so we've perturbed that singularity away. Okay, so that's, that's the point. And this we're supposed to contrast with what happens for spheres. So uh, because uh, Huisken has classified the convex solutions, you know, closed convex solutions, if you have a sphere, because it's strictly convex, if I wiggle it a little bit, what I get is still strictly convex. So his result says that it will still disappear at a sphere. So the entropy of the, um, I cannot make the entropy of the sphere go down by wiggling it. OK, so that's the result. Now we, we want to prove it. Now there's a technical, um, OK, so the entropy itself, you'd love to write down a first and second variation formula for the entropy. But because of the way that the entropy is defined by taking a supremum over points and scales, there's not going to be a nice integral formula for it. Okay, so the, the second variation is, is not going to, uh, the first and second variation will not be so nice. So the way we deal with that is we're actually going to work with these f functionals and we're going to show that the entropy uh, is actually achieved by one specific f functional, this f01 functional, and we're going to find a way to decrease that. Um, now, there's going to be some problems because translations and rescalings are, are sort of in the kernel of, of this problem. So we we're going to have to mod out for those appropriately. Okay, so this is the notion that we use. This, oh, we'll say something is f-stable. So we say a self-shrinker is f-stable 
if for every variation of the self shrinker, then I can vary the x and t so that the second derivative is non negative. This first variation formula that we wrote down shows that the first variation is always 0. So it's stable if this second variation is, is non negative. It's not hard to see that the sphere is stable. In fact, it follows, uh, I mean, you can see it variationally by looking at the second variation of this operator, which we've computed. Of course, it also follows immediately from, from uh, uh, Huiskin's result. OK, so, or almost immediately, uh, the splitting theorem. So this is why, so f stability on its own is not, you know, it's, it's reasonable enough, but, but why would you do it? Um, the point is that um, we need to connect it up to this entropy stability, and this is the result which does. So we call this a splitting theorem, just because it's related to a product with a line. So uh, what's an example of a self-shrinker that splits? So if you take the cylinder, that's a circle, cross a line in space uh, as a, an isometric product. So on something like that, the entropy cannot be uniquely achieved. So because it's a product, if I look at any point along the axis, it's the same as any other. So that entropy, when I take the soup, is going to be achieved at any point along the axis at unit scale. Well, that's a problem, because if I'm trying to bring the entropy down, I can't localize things. Right? I can't make a local change here and expect it to do anything to the entropy way out there. Okay, so, so we want to deal with this splitting case. On the other hand, that when it splits off a line, um, you sort of, you're really working in the wrong dimension. If you want to understand the cylinder, you forget about the cylinder, you should be working on the circle in the plane. You just have that line, forget about the line. You really should be looking at the circle. So, so we're going to deal separately with the case where it splits. So suppose you have a self-shrinker that does not split, and suppose it's F unstable. Then, in fact, it's entropy unstable. In other words, you can choose a, a compactly supported variation, sigma S, so this is a one-parameter family of, of graphs over the initial sigma, where, in fact, they agree with the initial sigma except uh, in some compact set. And for every S not equal 0, the entropy has gone down. Okay, so this, uh, so this connects things up. Okay, so how would, you, how would you prove the splitting theorem? So the key, for, for the key that makes the splitting theorem work is that, um, okay, so I said along the cylinder, the entropy, which is the soup of these functionals, is achieved at scale 1 at any point along the axis. Well, so what we show is that, in fact, if you have a self-shrinker, well, we know the entropy is always achieved at scale 1 and centered at the origin. If it is also achieved at another point, then it's not hard to see from the monotonicity formula, now looking at the associated mean curvature flow, that, in fact, it splits off a line. We go one better. We show that not only uh, are there no other places where the entropy is achieved, as a soup, in fact, it's strictly less. So what you might worry about is maybe there's a sequence of points going to infinity on your comp non-compact self-shrinker, where the f functional centered there gets closer and closer to the entropy. You might worry that would happen. So we show that does not happen. So once you've done this, everything has been localized. That f functional, so if you think of varying x0 and t0, you get a strict maximum right at the, at the 0, 1. So if you want to bring down the soup over all of those, you just need to worry about a neighborhood of, of 0, 1. Okay? Because everything else is already strictly less. So if you do a small perturbation, it will stay strictly less. We just need to bring it down near here. Well, for doing that, you just need to understand things right near the, the uh, 0 and 1. That's a more localized thing. And so now, f in, uh, if it's f unstable, that exactly allows you to do that. You can choose a variation which is bringing it down. Okay, so this is, this is a, sort of the idea um, for the splitting theorem. Again, the key is just to, to get this, this, fact, this first fact that f01 is a strict maximizer for f of x0, t0. Here I mean, I'm thinking that sigma is fixed, so I'm thinking of f of x0, t0 of sigma as a function on rn plus 1 cross r plus. So just the varying the x0 and t0. And that function has a strict maximum. OK, so we've reduced the problem. That splitting theorem has reduced the problem to classifying the f-stable self-shrinkers. If it's f-unstable, we can bring it down. So 
So I just need to, to figure out what are the f-stable ones. Those are the ones we can't bring down. And again, there'll be sort of an induction on dimension argument. If it splits, then I look at it in one dimension less. OK, so, um, so what are the only f-stable self shrinkers? So we show that, in fact, the sphere and the plane are the only f-stable self shrinkers. Okay, so, and now combining this, this result gives the classification of, of these entropy-stable self shrinkers. So it says that, this says that if you are not at a sphere, plane, or product of one of those in lower dimensions, here's where that inductive on dimension argument comes in, you can actually bring down the entropy. Is that clear how that fits together? Matthias uh, says yes. Will anyone second that? No. Yeah. Uh, oh, so that's that, that, that's with the splitting. So there. So how do we do that? How do we show the, that it's strictly less? What we actually do is we take so take a, gen, a point x zero t zero. You can choose a path connecting it to 0, 1. If you choose the path right, then and if you differentiate the functional along the path, you see it actually goes down. No, so it's yeah. y, y OK. Let me get a little dangerously well, close to the edge. In the previous slide, uh -huh. you say that you have this uh, non-convex self-shrinker, and one of the third there, uh, and you say that the entropy is a t that you are here. Right. You say 1, right. and one third is not a t at any other point. That's right. Right. So why that? Um, so that's because I look at the f functional centered at any other point, yeah. and now I connect that. So the point where it's where I'm looking, considering that x zero t zero, I connect that by a path in the x zero t zero space to zero one, and I now consider f of x zero t zero of sigma along that path, okay. and if I choose the path right, just a direct calculation shows that that I get a, a it's decreasing along the path. Right, right, right. But I'm sorry, Felix. If it's, not if it's not splitting off a line, exactly, exactly. That's right. So we have a monotonicity formula for mean curvature flows. We don't have a monotonicity formula for self shrinkers because those are like slices. So, so we can't quite do that. What we do instead is we just, we just literally, you know, compute, take the. And when we differentiate this, remember I wrote down the general first variation formula for the f functionals, where I vary the surface and the two parameters, x0 and t0. Well, now I'm going to return to that formula, but I'm going to fix the surface, so I'm just varying the parameters. And um, I get some quantities in there. Uh, actually, maybe this is very risky because I don't know if I'll be able to come back to it. Uh, but yeah, I, do, I, I should show you this. Can everybody remember the number 101? <laughs> okay, so this reminds me that my first, uh, one of my first classes at the second semester, uh, second quarter at Stanford as a grad student was a differential geometry class with Alex Frere. And on the first day of the class, he um, gave a quick rundown of all the results we were going to cover during the semester. And my, uh, one of my friends, Andrew Stone, uh, who since less, left math, was a, uh, was a few minutes late for the class. So he hadn't heard that Alex was just running through quickly all the, the results he was going to do for the semester. So at the end of the class, Andrew said something like, don't you think he was going kind of fast? <laughs> OK, so. OK, so here's the first variation. OK, look at this first variation formula for the f functional. And now throw out this term, because we're not, uh, we're not changing the, the surface. I'm just looking as I change the parameters. So uh, and now let's forget about this one. Let me just forget about changing scale for a moment. And let me look at this term over here. So what happens, uh, imagine now as I, as I move along a path, what I'm getting is uh, this inner product Right, so here, right, right, right. So here I have this uh, inner product of uh, x, you know, this, this normal part. So basically, I'm getting this translation vector. OK, what happened to one of my terms? OK, 
Okay, so roughly speaking, I'm getting a translation vector there. And, and what that means is that unless that translation, see that, that formula is not quite right. Okay, like I was saying, let me come back to that at the end and let me write down the right formula for you once we have time. Basically, the vector that, the, the form, if I differentiate, the, um, there's a typo in that formula, unfortunately, which serves to poorly illustrate my point. But what, we sh what should be showing up there is the translation vector. Um, so it's like y, the, the, the direction I'm moving on, y dot the normal n. And so I'm going to get something negative coming from that variation unless y dot n vanishes, which means that the vector that I'm moving along is tangent to the surface. And so that's going to give the product structure. So it's going to be something negative unless it's actually a product in that direction. That's, wh that's what's going to, to actually happen. And it's very easy to see if you just, um, just vary one of the parameters. It's a little tricky choosing the path to do it along if you uh, vary both x0 and t0. It seems to be some crazy miracle. So the, the things that you do are along the lines of that formula. So I showed you how just using the fact that script L of mod x squared is equal to 2n minus x squared, I showed you how to, to use that to show one of the terms dropped out in the first variation. Well, you do lots of other things like that. You take script L applied to crazy combinations of things, see miraculous cancellations of terms, and, and it all works out. It's not, it's, it's very, I, I, I'm not sure why it works, but that, that's what's going on here. Okay, so, uh, right, so SN, so, right, so this is what we want to prove now. The sphere and the plane are the only F-stable cell shrinkers. And um, uh, Matthias was just vouching for the fact that I had convinced you that this together with the splitting theorem explains why if I'm at any other cell shrinker, I can uh, perturb it away. I can wiggle it a little bit and decrease the entropy. Okay, so now, now we'd like to, uh, um, most of the rest of the time is going to be uh, explaining how to prove this theorem, why F stability implies that it's the sphere or Euclidean space. So it turns out uh, that this is much easier to do in the compact case. So suppose, suppose you have a closed self-shrinker, so compact, no boundary, and it's F stable. Then it's pretty, actually pretty quick from what we have so far to see that it must be a sphere. Um, the the non-compact case it tends, is, is the harder one. In this, if, so this result follows from combining two things. The first thing is we're going to use F, uh, F, the fact that it's F stable to show that the mean curvature can't change sign. So the mean curvature is greater or equal to zero. Um, since the mean curvature satisfies a nice uh, eigenfunction type equation, L of h equal h, a Harnack inequality says that if it doesn't change sign, it's either identically zero or it's everywhere positive. So there's, there are two cases to consider. If it's everywhere zero, it's just a plane. Um, okay, so that's, that's the less interesting case. If it's everywhere positive, it turns out in the compact case, it must be a sphere. Okay, so that's uh, so the second the second result. So the first step is we show that F stable implies that H doesn't change sign. The second result is a classification uh, of the embedded self shrinkers that don't change sign. So um, in 1990, in, in his uh, uh, original uh, the, the paper with the monotonicity formula, uh, Huiskin showed that uh, the sphere is the only closed self shrinker with H, uh, you know, with positive H. In 93, he came back and he showed that. If you now consider the, the open ones, so complete non-compact, uh, then the cylinders and the planes are the only ones, but, but he had to assume a bound on mod A. So that was, was very natural from, from his point of view because he was looking at type 1 singularities where these came from rescalings, and so they naturally came with a bound on mod A. Okay, but for these complete non-compact things, most of, uh, you know, a good deal of the difficulty is from worrying about what happens at infinity, precisely worrying about things like what, you know, you don't have any bounds on mod A, right? The curvature could be blowing up in a very bad way as you go towards infinity. And so uh, Toby and I showed that, that it holds in the general case, even without a bound on mod A. We weren't able to, I mean, of course, in the end it follows because it's a cylinder that there is a bound on mod A. We weren't able to directly show that. We were able to get uh, bounds on appropriate powers of mod A, and, th and that, that ended up being good enough. I'll explain that a little bit later. Okay, so let's. Um, Let's see why this is. So now I'd like to explain, um, okay, so there are these two results that we need. We need that if it's F stable, it, the, the mean curvature can't change sign. And then we need to classify the ones where the mean curvature doesn't change sign. So let's think about that first result for a moment. How do we understand um, why is it that the mean curvature can't change sign when it's F stable? So as I said, that's actually uh, 
easy, uh, pretty easy to see at this point, given with what, what we have here um, in the compact case. And the reason is that spectral theory is much simpler in the compact case, in the case of a closed manifold. So let me just remind you quickly uh, about spectral, the spectral theory. So this operator L um, is symmetric with respect to this weighted L2 space, these weighted L2 spaces. Uh, and uh, because of it's symmetric, the spectral theory is, is, is just what you get from uh, linear algebra for symmetric operators. So in other words, there are a sequence of eigenfunctions, mu i. Um, mu1 is the lowest. And then they, those go off to, to plus infinity. They come with eigenfunctions, ui. So L of ui is equal to minus mu i of ui. So again, remember this convention that we have for the eigenvalue that we stick that minus sign in there because uh, the Laplacian is not, is a negative, you know, it, it doesn't have the right sign as an operator, but, but we just stick that minus sign in there to change it so it looks like it does. The next fact uh, what you need to recall is that the lowest eigenfunction does not change sign. Okay, so this... Uh, Right, so, so this is a general fact uh, for these, the, these sort of operators. Uh, this is very much related to this, the fact that I have this uh, hard inequality up here that for the first eigenfunction. That's saying that, that, that the lowest eigenfunction is actually unique, um, so multiplicity one. In other words, once the mu's go up, you could have something like on a, a sphere where the eigenfunctions come with huge multiplicities the higher eigenfunction, but that lowest eigenfunction is always multiplicity one. Of course, um, if, if you had one that was multiplicity two, uh, you could form some linear combination of them which did change sign. So the fact that the lowest doesn't change sign is basically equivalent to the fact that, that the, the lowest uh, is multiplicity one. So the next fact we need to recall is that if you have, uh, since this is a symmetric operator, if you have two eigenvalues that are different, then their eigenfunctions are orthogonal with respect to the, the appropriate inner product. Again, just linear algebra. Okay, so, so given, now, now uh, just recalling the spectral theory, let's just quickly give the proof in the compact case. Okay, so we have this uh, closed cell shrinker and we're gonna assume it, that, that it's uh, H changes sign. We wanna show that it's F unstable. Well, H itself is an eigenfunction of L. That was a calculation, so L of H is equal to H. Since h changes sign, it's not the lowest eigenfunction, so there's one below it. So, so we have this function u1, eigenvalue mu1, which is less than minus 1, and corresponding eigenfunction u1 that doesn't change sign. So uh, now let's look at this variation. So I use this u1 to define a variation, so I vary sigma s in the direction u1. I mean in the normal direction, but at speed u1. Okay, so here we've got this set up. And now, uh, remember, to be F unstable means that I have a variation so that no, of sigma so that no matter how I vary X and T, I get something negative. That's what it means to be F unstable. So it means it's, it's unstable even after we mod out for translations and dilations. Okay, so let's, uh, here we recall, this is the second variation formula. So on this line, I've recalled the general second variation formula. The only difference is in the first term, the first term actually has a minus uh, u1 times L of u1, and I plugged in that L of u1 is minus mu times u1. Okay, so I just evaluated, I uh, used that it was an eigenfunction. So here, um, S, uh, sorry, y and h are the, the uh, variations of the x and t. So I have this formula, and I would like to show that this is negative no matter what y and h are. So there are three terms, three square terms. Each of those terms is negative. And then I have two cross terms. The problem is the cross terms. I don't know what the sign is on the cross term. They don't come with a sign. So those cross terms, I need to absorb into the square terms to make the whole thing negative. So well, the easiest way to absorb them is to make them zero. And so that follows because, now remember, um, h and, and y dot n, so h is an eigenfunction. Let's explain it with h first. So we know h is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue minus 1. u1 is an eigenfunction with an eigenvalue less than that. These two eigenvalues are different. Therefore, these two functions must, must be orthogonal in the weighted space. So this integral is 0. The same argument applies to the other term. y dot n is an eigenfunction, that, this time with eigenvalue minus 1 half. And so that drops out. 
So we're just left with the three square term. Because mu1 is negative, this is negative no matter what um, h and y are. So it's f unstable. So, the, so this means that in the comp so we've shown in the compact case that the only f stable variations are the ones where h doesn't change sign. Uh, I'm sorry, did I use? Yes. I, I, I need, OK, so what, I, what do I use about uh, mu1? I use that it is negative, because that forces this first term to be negative. And I use that it is not equal to minus 1 half or minus 1, because that forces u1 to be orthogonal to h and y dot n. Right. Right. That's right. OK, so I, I don't actually, if I knew that mu, I mean, of course, Yes, I, I do really use that mu1 is less than minus 1, because otherwise um, h would be the lowest eigenvalue and h would be positive. I mean, I guess that's the way to say that I use that mu1 is less than minus 1. But but in this inequality, the only thing I use that is negative and not equal to minus 1 and, or minus 1 half. OK, so um, right. Okay, so now I wanted to, to change course briefly to make sure I got to say a little bit about this. But let's, let me just talk about an application of this. And now we're going uh, to uh, give sort of an application to, uh, to mean curvature flow. So the first thing I want to recall is that, uh, OK, so what did this theorem say? The, so the theorem says, now suppose I have a compact guy, and it's not the sphere. Well, if it's not the sphere and it's comp, uh, a compact self-shrinker, I can bring the entropy down a little bit. Now, you imagine for an application that we have a mean curvature flow, and each time we, we're hitting a, a compact guy that is not the sphere, we'd like to do one of these wiggles and start the flow. So we know we'll bring it down a little bit each time. But we may have to do this an, an infinite number of times or an accumulating number of times that, that could, be, could be bad in order for, for uh, um, knowing that it really ever gets anywhere. Okay, so you don't want to have to do an infinite number of replacements or wiggles. So the way that you're going to rule this out is you'll show that each time you do it, you bring the entropy down a definite amount. There's some positive epsilon. So that every time I do a wiggle, I bring the entropy down by at least epsilon. Well, the entropy was, had some initial finite value. It's never going to get below 0. In fact, it can never get below 1, the entropy of the plane. So the total number of wiggles is bound by that, that distance divided by epsilon. Okay, so if I can get some definite epsilon, that I always bring the entropy down. So how am I going to do that? Given I, that? So given each one, I know I can bring it down a little. But also, the entropy is obviously a continuous function on the space of self-shrinkers. So what I need in order to, connect, to, to finish that off is I need that the space of self-shrinkers is compact. Okay, so, so that's, and that's exactly the result that I've, uh, I've proved for you last time, that in R3, the space of, of self-shrinkers, given a bound on, on the genus and the entropy, is compact. Here, because I'm just, I am I've, just I've so far restricted to the compact case, I'm going to assume a bound on the diameter, too, so that I know that, that what I get. Of course, you can have, conceivably, you could have a limit of compact self-shrinkers converged to a non-compact one, because the diameters could go to infinity. But if I assume a uniform bound d for the diameter, that can't happen. Okay, So this is the result here. So, if you combine our entropy st stability result with the, uh, uh, the compactness theorem, then we see that we can choose a positive epsilon so that our wiggle, our replacement, always bring the, brings the entropy down by at least this epsilon. And this is what forces there in, in an application. This, will, this is what would give you that there are only a finite number of wiggles that you have to do. OK, so now what's the application? OK, so this application. Uh, Right, so, so uh, we're going to define something called a piecewise mean curvature flow. So now, um, in mean curvature flow, there's typically one of two things you can do. So you're worried about singularities. You don't like singularities. You can either attempt to flow through the singularities with a weak flow, or you can sneak right up on a singularity and then do some kind of change and then restart the flow. So that second is, is um, a, like a surgery process. So for instance, like the Huisken sinistrari um, in the two convex case, you get right up near that singularity, you do a surgery, you restart the flow. So that's not a continuous flow. 
It's a sort of a piecewise flow with you do these replacements along the way. Now, if you're, um, another example, of course, is the you know, Hamilton uh, Perlman uh, surgeries for Ritchie flow, where you run the Ritchie flow, you get up near a singularity, you cap it off, you, know, you do your surgeries, and you restart the flow. For all, the cut, if you understand the surgeries well enough, then even though in the end you're not proving a theorem necessarily about the Ritchie flow or mean curvature flow, you can still get whatever applications that you want. So for instance, suppose you knew, suppose you were interested in topological applications and you completely understood the topo topological changes that you made when you did your, your uh, discrete jumps, your, your either surgeries or in our case wiggles, then you could still get topological applications from it that you would get from the mean curvature flow or Ritchie flow. So in this case, our piecewise mean curvature flow, we're going to run the flow, then we come up on one of these compact singularities, We've given a recipe for remove, if it's a, so if it's a shrinking sphere, wonderful, we know it's an extinction, we completely understand everything, you know, game over. Uh, suppose it, we came up on an angular <coughs> shrinking donut. Then we're going to, the theorem allows us to make a change, we wiggle that shrinking donut a little bit, we just replace it by a graph over itself, which does not change any topology, we restart the flow. Because the entropy has now gone down by this definite epsilon, it's below the entropy of the shrinking donut, this shrinking donut never shows up again as a singularity. Okay, so now we can keep doing this as we, uh, okay, so this is a, the idea for the piecewise mean curvature flow. And, and for the piecewise mean curvature flow, we'd like to keep a couple of things controlled when we, we do the changes. The first is we want the area actually preserved at a change. And the second is we want the entropy to only go down. Those are the quantities that we're, we're tracking, so we just want them to be well, well defined. Okay, so then this is what we, we show. Now this, is a, this theorem is actually a very positive spin on what we cannot do. Okay, so uh, here we say that we can define a piecewise mean curvature flow, you know, starting in an arbitrary closed uh, surf hypersurface, surface, this is now in R3. The reason, by the way, the reason I've restricted to R3 now is the compactness theorem we only proved in, for self-shrinkers in R3. So everything else is in arbitrary uh, dimensions, co-dimension one, but arbitrary dimension but the compactness theorem is restricted to R3 and for, for several reasons, not the least of which is gauss binet is used in the proof. Okay. In fact, that may even be the most. Um, that and, and bounds on total curvature, which is, of course, related. Okay, so here's the result. You start with a closed embedded surface in R3. So then we can define a piecewise mean curvature flow uh, so that it's defined up to some time, and at that time, there's only one of two things that can happen. So we run the flow up until either we hit a, a, a round point, extinction in a round point, wonderful, or uh, we hit a non-compact singularity. So saying you have a non-compact singularity means that if you were to rescale what you saw near that point, so this is the rescaling factor, that that diameter goes to infinity. So, so another, right, so this is a, a positive spin on saying that we still don't know what to do, uh, how to finish things off when we hit a non-compact singularity. Okay, so why is that? Um, what's the problem there? The problem there is we've given a way to bring the entropy down. So if you give me a self-shrinker, even a non-compact one, that's not a sphere or cylinder or plane, then I can bring the entropy down. But now give me, instead of giving me a self-shrinker, give me a surface that is near a self-shrinker. Now, if it's compact, if the self-shrinker is compact, then being near it means you're actually a graph over it. I can still bring the entropy down. But suppose your surface is non-compact. Okay, so then a large piece of it is near one self-shrinker, but very far away, there's something else going on that I don't understand at all. Okay, so, and I cannot bring the entropy down because this piece right here, the entropy uh, of the self-shrinker, may not even be related to the entropy of the surface. Imagine now that you had um, right, so imagine that near one point you're hitting a cylinder and then somewhere else, so you're having a, a pinch, right, so you have this neck pinch, this cylinder, okay, so let's, let's go back, let's think about Grayson's dumbbell. Grayson's dumbbell, you have two shrinking spheres connected by a cylinder. So now imagine that I took two humongous anginant donuts and connected them by a very tin, uh, thin cylinder. And I did the cylinder so thin that the first singularity that I'm going to hit is going to be a pinch, a neck pinch coming from that, that cylinder. Okay, so 
the, the process that I would have here, I mean the cylinder is a bad example, imagine something else uh, that, that's not stable. Then I would do some replacement there, but this somehow is not, has nothing to do with the entropy. The entropy is really coming from the entropy of the anginate guys, which is larger, we think, than the entropy of the cylinder. Okay, so this is the problem. You can't localize things as well if you're creating a non-compact singularity. Okay, so, uh, right, so this is an example, and this is more illustrating, an illustration of, of where we hope this is going, because again, we, we still have to figure out how to deal with these non-compact singularities. Okay, right, so let's go back. Um, right, so let's go back. So now, let me remind you, so, so here what we've done, this was an aside, and now let me remind you again, we, we want to uh, focus on this in the comp, so uh, the fact that H um, cannot change sign if it's uh, F stable. So now the point was that we deformed in the, this, if, so if H changes sign, H was not the lowest eigenfunction, so, so this eigenfunction was below that. That gave us a deformation, which was then orthogonal uh, to these two, two cross terms that we're so worried about. The cross terms, which are the only thing that can go wrong, because the three squares are all negative. Okay, so that was fine in the compact case. Let's move on to the non-compact case. Okay, so this is it's kind of a natural break, so maybe I'll just check and see if there are any questions about the other stuff, um, because I'm not going to return to that. Jacob, sorry, what's that? Uh, it, it must be true, but it's not proven. So in fact, what it almost certainly must be true is that there are, um, okay, so certainly, th so the plane has the lowest, almost certainly, the next lowest is the sphere, and the next lowest is the cylinder in R3, almost certainly, but it's, you can't really show that, Unf or rather, we can't really show that. Okay, if one could really do, so this piecewise mean curvature flow, if we could really do that without having to, to, to forget about the compact cases, then you could do things like that. Okay, so now the key for the, uh, the compact case somehow was the fact that this H shows up as an eigen uh, function for this operator L, and uh, so we want to understand that again in the non-compact case. So uh, here, uh, since, since sigma is non-compact, we're not guaranteed to have any, any spectrum. Okay, so we don't necessarily get this, you don't get this nice sequence of, eigen, of eigenfunctions with eigenvalues going to infinity and, and all of that. So uh, you can still define the bottom of the spectrum. So the bottom of the spectrum is defined by this, this Rayleigh quotient. So you take um, the infimum over all, say, sm uh, smooth functions with compact support of, of f with L of f and then divided by f squared. So since it's non-compact, we have to allow the possibility that this number is minus infinity. So how could, for instance, how could that happen? Well, remember the operator L has this mod A squared in it. Suppose that mod A squared was going to infinity as you went out to infinity. Okay, so then you could take a, your F as a test function, could be a, ti a guy with tiny support right around a place where A is huge. So you'd get, so this, that, because it's a tiny support, these two factors, or, or, you know, we don't really care, they don't change very much. And so you basically just get um, that, uh, a mod A squared over one, minus mod A squared over one. And so then the, uh, that, that would give you a sequence of test functions where this, this went to minus infinity. Okay, so this, this could be rather bad. So mu1 might be minus infinity. It's not guaranteed that, uh, that necessarily that mu1 is represented by an eigenfunction. Even if it is, it's not guaranteed that the eigenfunction's in L2 even in the weighted L2 or anything like that. Okay, but we still do have a bottom of the spectrum. So here, so we, we can say some things about it. So again, this minus infinity case, that's rather bad. Um, it, it would be, for instance, it, it would not be likely that you could find a, a, an eigenfunction with L of u equal to, minus in, uh, equal to infinity times u. Right? That would not make much sense. So, but if mu1 is not minus infinity, then we show there's a positive function u, so that L of u is equal to minus mu1 of u. So again, for all of these things, you're supposed to think about what the, the standard spectral theory in the compact case. The lowest eigenfunction doesn't change sign. 
Here, the bottom of the spectrum is realized by, here I'll call it an eigenfunction, but it's not guaranteed to be square integral or anything like that, which doesn't change sign. Uh, the next fact is that if I have, okay, so what do I mean by the weighted W12 space? So that just means that, uh, so V is in the weighted W12 space if V and grad V are both in the weighted L2 space. So if I have an eigenfunction of this lowest eigenvalue that's in the weighted W12 space, then it must be just a constant multiple of this positive function U. This is the uniqueness result. Okay, so we prove this. So in the same, this is again very similar, it's a, you know, exactly analogous to what you have in the compact case, um, except that you, know, you need to do more to, to justify these things. Uh, the third thing is we show that if mu1 is not minus infinity, then in fact mod a, uh, even times mod x, is in the weighted L2 space. Okay, so we um, you can get some estimates uh, to show that. All of these things are, are proven by, uh, you know, using the formulas that we have for L and appropriate integrations by parts. Okay, so um, the first one, so for instance, how would you show the first one that you get uh, this? Well, if mu1 is not minus infinity, then it's not hard to see that mu1 is actually the limit of mu1's of, of a ball of radius r. So these functions that were, were with compact support, you can actually ask that they have compact support in a ball of radius r, let r go to infinity. So on each of these compact balls, there exists a lowest eigenfunction. And so now I'm going to take the limit as that runs off to infinity. The eigenvalue is changing. Uh, but I, could, I can control it enough because of this bound that mu1 is not minus infinity, and, and I can extract limits. So of course, in order to get limits, you need uniform estimates. So you can see how it might even be related to something like that. OK. Sort of very rough, but, uh, but so the, the first step is recovering some of the, the things that we're familiar with with the spectral theory of compact uh, manifolds. OK, so now what do we do? Now, uh, so now suppose that H ch changes sign. In the compact case, we said, well, if it changes sign, it's not the lowest eigenfunction, so it's, it's below there. So we'll do something like that here. Notice that I can't necessarily, even, so if L of H is equal to H, that would suggest that mu1 is less than or equal to minus 1. But I'm not allowed to stick h in, in the, as a test function into this Rayleigh quotient. h is not compactly supported. And right off, I don't even know, so compact support, you don't need compact support. You know, you can, functions with compact support are dense in, in various Sobolev spaces. So if you just knew that h was in, in this w, you know, weighted w12 space, that would almost be enough. Okay, but we don't, we don't necessarily, we, so we have to show that, right? So, Okay, so the rough idea. So first, uh, so now what, what I want to show is that if h changes sign, then mu1 is less than minus 1. Well, if mu1 is minus infinity, of course, we're done. So we can assume that mu1 is not minus infinity. So that means that, that mod a times x is in the weighted L2 space. Now, the self-shrinker equation tells me that h is actually equal to a half x dot n. So h is bounded by mod x. But differentiating this equation, you get a nice formula for the, the, the gradient of h. So the gradient of h is bounded by the set mod a times x. So this means that the gradient of h is square integrable too. So now using that, that mu1 was not minus infinity, we've shown that h is actually in the weighted w12 space. Um, so this, uh, together with the fact that, that mod a times h, remember the operator has this mod a squared term in there too. So if you want to control that, you need a little control on that as well. This is enough to show that h is an allowable test function. Using h as a test function in the Rayleigh quotient, the fact that, that L of, of h is, is equal to h means that mu1 is less than or equal to minus 1. Once you know that, uh, there are two possibilities. Either mu1 is equal minus 1, or it's less than it, right? We want to show that it's less than, so we have to rule out that mu1 is equal to minus 1. But, if mu, mu, but now we go back to this uniqueness result we showed. We know that there is a positive function, L of u, with uh, a, a positive function u with L of u equal to minus mu1 times u. If h also satisfies that equation, our uniqueness result says that h must be a multiple of that positive function, a constant multiple. But h, doesn't, uh, h changes sign, and that positive function does not. So that cannot be. So we conclude that, that in fact, mu1 is less than minus 1. OK. 
Okay. My mic will test shows that I'm getting too technical. <laughs> so now, the, uh, okay, so the F unstable variation when mu1 is less than minus 1. Now again, again, just think about the compact case. What did we do there? So once we had that eigenfunction that was below minus 1, we stuck that in as a variation. And, and then everything was great because that gave me a negative thing. And because its eigenvalue was different from those other two eigenvalues, those cross terms went away. We're not going to be so lucky now. Okay, because the, that orthogonality to show those cross term goes away, there are two reasons wh why. One is I don't want to stick in a non-compactly supported function into the variation. I like my functions to have compact support. So instead of sticking in this function u1, I'd rather cut it off, chop it off at a large ball, and just stick that part in. The second thing is showing this orthogonality, so the symmetry of the operator, comes from doing integrations by parts. That's great on a compact manifold. There are no boundary terms to worry about. Here we have these functions which are not compactly supported. They're boundary terms, or you know, terms at infinity, if you like. And those do not, are not necessarily uh, good. Okay, so we don't necessarily have the estimates to, to deal with those. So instead, we can't actually show that this lowest eigen... So instead, we work with lowest eigenfunctions on a large compact ball. And we show that if that ball is large enough, then the eigenvalue is already less than minus 1. Um, that, those functions will, have, will be zero on the boundary of that large ball, but the, the integration by parts, which shows that, that the, uh, the, the symmetry, which shows that, that, that the terms um, are orthogonal, different eigenfunctions are orthogonal, needs both of the eigenfunctions to vanish on the boundary. For the, the Laplacian, you would look at the divergence of u grad u minus, uh, I'll probably say them in the same order, minus v, uh, but say, sorry, u grad v minus v grad u. Right, this askew symmetric thing. The divergence of that, then the cross term goes away, and you just get the two Laplacian applied to either one. That's, that's what you do. So you need that both u and v to make that operator work. You need both u and v to be zero on the boundary. Here, um, the u is going to be this eigenfunction that comes from, from the mu1 being less than minus 1. The v will be applied with v equal to h, the mean curvature, and v equal to a y dot n, where, where the y is the translation. But of course, there's no reason to assume that h or y dot n is 0 on the boundary of these balls. So we're going to have some boundary terms. So the point is, is to be able to control these. And so we have to, you, know, you get some estimates and, and show that, that these are OK. So that, that's a rough sketch of, of how you do it uh, when mu1 is less than minus 1. OK, so that's enough to improve f instability. And uh, so here I should go back and show you the operator again, just so you, to remind you. OK, so remember the, the operator, the second variation formula, we had these three squares that were negative. And then we had these cross terms. So if, by the way, if the constants on these negative guys were large enough, you could just do a Cauchy-Schwartz and get rid of these cross terms by absorbing a little bit of the h times h in here. And then u1, I could absorb over there. Right? So if this constant, this, so for instance, one thing you would see, that if mu1 is less than minus 3 halves, Already, that's enough. You, don't, you can just use uh, like an absorbing inequality to get rid of the cross terms. Okay, but now, if these guys aren't actually 0, but they're bounded, so to say they're almost orthogonal, what you show is that this, the inner product of these two functions is bounded by a small constant times the product of the two norms. But now, that small constant means I can, it's enough to absorb into these two negative, these negative terms. That's the idea. Okay, so I just want to say a few words. Uh, here about the classification of mean convex self shrinkers. So, what's really driving this, so that by the classification of, of mean convex self shrinkers, I mean the fact that if you have a, a self shrinker of positive mean curvature, uh, then it must be a sphere or cylinder. Embedded self shrinker of positive mean curvature must be a sphere or cylinder. So, and this is the, re this is the result that, that uh, Huiskin proved in 90 and 93, assuming a bound on mod A, and then we remove the, the, the need for the bound on mod A. Um, OK, so what's really driving that result is a Simons type identity. So for a minimal surface, then the second fundamental form uh, actually satisfies Laplacian plus mod A squared. It's in the kernel of this Laplacian plus mod A squared. Um, and so the, uh, that. Uh, for a minimal surface, if you take the trace of that, you take the trace of A, you get zero. So, so there's nothing left over. So, however, for a self shrinker, um, L of A is equal to A. So this is a, a sort of a tensor inequality, equality. 
and taking the trace of that, we get our, uh, equality, or our equation we've been working with that L of h is equal to h. Okay, because h is not zero this time, the trace of it you know, lives, uh, doesn't disappear. So this is really what drives things, the fact that L of a is equal to a and some uh, sort of matrix maximum principles. So one consequence of this fact, it's not hard to see, although I don't claim it's immediate, uh, is that the kernel, if you look at the kernel of a on a self-shrinker, that's going to consist of, uh, of uh, parallel vector fields. So that's where this factor of these things that split off come from. The second thing um, is that, so each of the, in, in a sense, which, which can be made precise but, but uh, takes a little bit of work, each of the principal curvatures is going to be an eigenfunction of L. Now because H, in the positive case, H is the lowest eigenfunction, I've already shown you that if you have any eigenfunction uh, of that lowest eigenvalue, it must be a multiple of the lowest eigen, of, the, of that uh, function h, which is a positive one. So already this is going to give that all of those principal curvatures are positive, um, or, or negative. None of those principal curvatures change a sign. And in fact, uh, as functions, they're all just multiples of each other. Okay, so I, this is in some way saying that it must be umbilic. So those principal curvatures must be the same, which is where the sphere is coming from. We would really like to be able to turn that into a proof. We can't quite see, how, we couldn't quite see how to, to make a proof out of that. I, somehow I feel like the classification should come really quickly just from this, this matrix maximum principle. So instead we had, sort of had to get a little bit, uh, get things a little bit dirty instead of getting it from uh, very general things. So, so here's what we do. So now we have a, a non-compact self-shrinker with, with H positive. So these are the main ingredients in terms, in showing that it, it must be a cylinder. The first is we use this Simon's type identity um, to get this nice uh, differential inequality. So L of mod A, in fact, is greater or equal to mod A. The only reason I'm keeping this, uh, this stuff in the middle is because um, we'll, we'll show that actually that must be an equality. So that stuff in the middle vanishes. So we get a nice identity uh, relating the, the derivative of A and the derivative of mod A. Okay, so the next ingredient, and we need to get some control. So the fact that H is positive, um, this is giving a lower bound for the eigenvalues uh, you know, of L, which is like a stability. So this sort of a stability gives a stability inequality. Uh, and now we're, now we're going to mimic um, so, um, sort of the Shane Simon Yao argument for uh, curvature estimates for minimal hypersurfaces. You playing the stability inequality off of the Simon's inequality, um, you can actually get a better bounds on mod a than you would think. In fact, mod a to, to the fourth ends up being integrable, and the derivative of mod a is, is square integrable. Uh, why, one re okay, so uh, what's, why is this useful? This shows that basically mod a is an allowable test function too in the, in the Rayleigh quotient. So now, okay, so, uh, so this using two to justify various integrations, uh, the fact that L of H is equal to H and L of mod A is greater or equal to mod A, those two things imply that in fact L of mod A is equal mod A and mod A is a constant times H. So this is a, a slight generalization of this uniqueness result that I, I wrote down uh, where we showed that you, know, you had this positive lowest eigenfunction and any other eigenfunction must be a multiple of it as long, once it's in this W12 space. Step two is showing that mod A lives in this W12 space. So mod, we didn't have L of mod A equal to mod A, but in fact, greater or equal is enough. And so then it pops out that, that uh, now by examining inequality in this first uh, inequality at the top, you see that grad of mod A squared is, is equal to um, grad of A squared. And so this usually is an inequality, the sort of uh, Cato inequality. But you can actually get a little bit more out of this inequality. So having an inequality here, if you go back and now carefully examine what that means, that gives a lot of identities for, for principal curvatures and their derivatives. And this, this is the equality um, that is the basis for, for, uh, for Huiskin's proof uh, in, in both cases. This forces, if the rank of A, again, we know the rank of A is constant. If the rank of A is one, um, th then you get a curve cross a, 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 a hyperplane. And that curve is a self-shrinker. So by the Abresch-Langer classification, if it's embedded, it's a, it's a circle. If the rank of A is at least 2, then this inequality forces all of the eigenvalues of A to be the same, and so, uh, except for the zero eigenvalues. 
And so it's uh, umbilic, and it's a sphere. Okay, and so that's just a little linear algebra. So I, I, I think that's it, but I did want to take uh, the, the opportunity just to, uh, uh, wanted to, on the path, behalf of everyone, to thank Andy and Luca for, for putting on a, a great uh, conference with, uh, in fact, a roast pig. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe everyone could clap for them. I don't know. Oh, it's, uh, you, don't you don't know. Yeah. It ends up depending on the rank. Yeah, 100. So we know we have a learn how to standard that is something about using architecture techniques that takes a point. We have a standard that goes to infinity. So we don't know the hex corresponding to it? No. So self expander, you're saying now? Or self shrinker? Self shrinker. OK, so in general, if you're a non compact self shrinker, no, you don't know whether or not. The second polynomial form is bounded. That's not known. Uh, from our compactness theorem, if you give me bounds in R3, if you give me bounds on the genus and the, 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 the entropy, then there's a bound on each compact set. But it may go to infinity as you go to infinity. So do you have any idea what this asymptotics could be? So, so right. So the asymptotics, um, it's, it will be asymptotic, to, assuming moderate to amounts of control, it's asymptotic to cylinders and cones. But in that case, the A would be bounded, right? But, uh, yeah, but, but asymptotic uh, sort of in a bracky sense. So th th there may be, uh, you know, very small things, like small, you know, maybe it's, it's a, uh, like asymptotic to a cone with multiplicity two, and there are two sheets connected by many necks or something like that.